So for those of you who have been following my original contents list, you will think today's time for Radix sort. Unfortunately, well, I've kind of reconsidered the end of the previous episode. I decided that instead of omitting certain details that, you know, don't really belong anywhere, I've decided to actually clump three of these details together in one video today. So yes, we are still looking at heaps. This will be a last sort of miscellaneous notes video that you can use to supplement your knowledge so far regarding heaps and heap sorts. You're watching episode 7, Miscellaneous Notes for Heaps and Heap Sorts. That's a very long title. Hello and welcome to Sorting Algorithms Plus Plus. Today's video comes to you in three parts, and these are going to be kind of separate, so, well, I guess they won't flow very well. Just think of these three pieces of information as something additional that will supplement your entire understanding of heaps and heap sorts. So without further ado, let us jump right in. First, did you know that a heap, which looks kind of complicated, can actually be stored in a flat array? Yes, that is actually correct. Now, even though when we want to store things like a graph or a tree, there is no way to represent this using a flat array. We're actually going to have to use an object that has, you know, more information regarding like who links to it in this direction, who links to it in that direction, that kind of stuff. But one interesting property about the binary heap makes it possible to just store it in a flat array. That is actually the fact that a heap is a complete tree. I mean, just imagine how a heap actually fills up. You go from the top, you go to the next row, you go left to right, go to the next row, you go left to right. This is almost exactly like just filling in a list. Of course, then you must be wondering how can I traverse a flat array the way I traverse a heap. You might even be worried that we will have to modify things like our sift up and sift down algorithms to work with this, but don't actually worry. You see, within a flat array, there's actually a very simple relation between a parent and its child. Now, let's just take a look at this. We have here a flat array that contains our entire heap. And what we're going to do is we're going to add an extra line of numbers, which will actually show us which position all these individual items are. So all right, now I can say, oh, at position 1, there is this node. At position 3, there is this node. But how do I find out how they're actually related to each other? In fact, the parent of any node is just its position divided by 2. If you don't get a whole number, simply round it down. I mean, just take a look at this. I want to check who is the parent of this particular node. All I have to do is to take its position in the actual array, divide it by 2, round it down, and there you go. 1, it's its parent. Moving on, when we want to find out which one is the child node of a particular node, all you have to do is take its position and multiply it by 2. That will point you to its left child. If you add 1 to that position, you will get a position of the right child. Of course, here it is in action. To get a left child of this node, I simply multiply its position by 2. Its right child is located at double its position, plus 1. Now, at this point, I do need to mention that in basically every programming language, an array starts from 0. That is, the index 0 is the first item in the array. In this case, however, if we were to use a function to map you know, parent and child relationships, we cannot actually use 0. The reason behind that, of course, is the fact that the child finding formula multiplying by 2 will just not work if you give it the value 0. Obviously, 2 times 0 is still 0, and as a result, you just won't get anywhere. So for the programming languages that have arrays beginning from 0, well, we just leave that slot empty. We might just initialize it to any number and leave it as it is. We're not actually going to use that particular slot. At any point of time, when the calculation actually points you beyond the boundaries of that array, you know that a value doesn't exist. For example, in this case, if I'm looking at this guy now, and I try to look for its left or right child, I perform a multiplication and realize that, hey, that completely exceeds the bounds of the array, what this means is there aren't any children. As mentioned earlier, this does not break sift up, sift down, extract max or extract min. And the reason for that is when we actually stated these algorithms, we just said things like go to the parent of this node or go to the child of this node. We never actually said how we want to do that, which is why of course now that you know how to do that using an array, you can just substitute that operation into the algorithm. 
So now we move on to part 2. Using the information that we've just looked at, I'm actually going to share with you how we can build a heap using even less time. Now, normally, your input comes to you in the form of an array as well. So in fact, what this means is if my input list is an array, and well, a heap is also an array, what this means is I can actually do all my operations directly on the input list. That is in fact what can be done when doing a build heap operation, in a sense that you don't even build a heap. You just take a look at the original input data, and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to treat this array as a heap. When you do that, you get, well, a tree structure, except of course the heap property is violated pretty much everywhere. And this is how we actually use the magical process of, well, speeding up the entire build heap operation by looking at only half the nodes. You see, in a heap, in fact, we don't really care about all the leaves. Why? Because the heap property says for every node, you want to look at its two children and decide if it's in the correct position. However, all the leaves don't have children. And as a result, there is no way that can actually violate the heap property. So what this means is the only nodes we have to look at are the non-leaf nodes. And that means we can safely ignore about half the nodes in the tree. Now, why half? Notice how in a complete tree, each level, if completely filled, has twice as many nodes as the previous level. By taking this effect into account, you'll realize that roughly half the nodes in the heap are leaves and can be safely ignored. Now, for the remaining non-leaf nodes, they could possibly violate the heap property. And so, we have to try and fix this problem wherever it crops up. In general, the approach to doing this is to start at the last non-leaf node, that is, the lowest, rightmost non-leaf node. Try to do sift down operations on that node until things are fixed. Then, move to the previous non-leaf node and repeat this process. What this means is, in this process, we are moving from right to left and bottom up. Or, if you want to think of this in terms of an array, we start in the middle and move left. So in this case, we start from the lowest non-leaf node, working our way up to the top. One is already in place, so we do nothing to it. One sift down operation happens at four. Two gets swapped upwards. We move up once again to the root of the heap. One gets swapped upwards, and we have a valid heap. Now, analyzing the time complexity of this version of build heap is actually kind of difficult, which is why, well, I'm just going to say this is actually faster. Of course, we can tell it is indeed faster. In fact, it is significantly faster. It takes only O n time. What this means is, despite the fact that heap sort still takes O n log n overall, seeing as that n times of extract min still takes n log n time, but now you save time building the actual heap. This actually confers an additional advantage as well, but that shall be part 3. Now, the fact that we aren't actually copying our input data out to a new array means that essentially the sorting happens in place. An in-place sorting algorithm doesn't use more memory than just the input list. Compare this to other sorting algorithms like say merge sort, which of course breaks down a list again and again and basically uses a lot of memory heap sort can actually all happen within the input array. Notice of course that even sift up and sift down operations can all happen within the flat array. In fact, after studying the traces of some implementations of heap sort, I am afraid I am going to have to contradict myself. Recall how I told you that a min heap lets you sort things in ascending order, whereas a max heap lets you sort things in descending order. Now, you don't actually have to do things that way. Let's say I have a max heap, but I want my sorted data in ascending order. Well, no problem. All I have to do is to populate my output array from the right to the left instead. As a result, I still get a list sorted in ascending order. So yes, I actually wasn't entirely correct when I told you that, you know, a particular type of heap was for a particular order, and I'll have to correct myself in that video. So in fact, here is how we can do a fully in-place heap sort in ascending order. In fact, the actual heap you want to use is a max heap. What happens is, every time you do an extract max, the heap gets smaller. What this means is, if we think of our heap as an array, and we perform extract max, basically everything is going to reorient itself, and the list now becomes one element shorter. In fact, this value of extracted can just be put in the slot that was just vacated. 
So what this means is we can actually use it to store our sorted list. Now we basically have an array that we're using for two purposes, one piece of it for the heap itself, and for everything we pull out of the heap, all we have to do is to put it in the next blank space. So you can kind of imagine how this works, you have an array that is originally all heap. Then you do an extract max and the heap gets one slot smaller. You place a new item in that vacant slot. You do that again and again, and basically, the heap gets smaller and smaller. Your sorted list gets larger and larger, until eventually the heap is of size 0 and your entire array is just taken up by all the sorted items. Notice what we're doing here, we're actually extracting the maximum each time and placing it as far right as we can go. And what this means is at the end of the day, we have a list that is sorted in ascending order. This of course is like what I was saying earlier, this is the equivalent of extracting things in the wrong order and then putting it into an array also in the wrong order and as a result two wrongs made right, which isn't really how life works. Anyway, that's it. That's it for this video. Hopefully these three kind of disconnected pieces of supplementary information will kind of strengthen your concepts with regard to heaps. I'm sorry this didn't flow as perfectly as I hoped, but well, I'd rather do things this way than actually not share the knowledge. So I hope, you know, you understand where I'm coming from. But anyway, that's all there is for this episode of Sorting Algorithms Plus Plus. If you have any comments, queries, or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below. Don't forget to follow the official Twitter account for this channel at twitter.com slash 0612tv. As always, I appreciate every like, favorite, and subscription you give me. But until next time, you're watching 0612tv.